Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bright Eye European Virtual Tour, our second stop. And today we're in uh, Spain and Portugal. Uh, my name is Hege. I am head of community at Bright Eye Ventures, uh, and I'm doing my very best to support our portfolio companies of uh, brilliant edtech companies. And that's including events like this, where I can get, uh, where we can all get together and share knowledge, experience, and inspiration. And I'm also trying to uh, be on top of the tech, so hopefully that will be all good. You have to bear with me. Uh, we have an amazing lineup today. It's a great honor to get to hear from co-founder and co-CEO Gonzalo Manrique from Ironhack and Cristobal Viedma, co-founder of Lingo Kids. Our very own David Guerin, principal at BrightEye, will host the conversation before he's joined on stage after by um, uh, on the investment side, speaking to Jose from JME Ventures, Juan Lopez from Kibo and Antonio Miguel from Mustard Seed Mace. So please, people, keep uh, questions coming in the chat. We'll try and get to as much as we can answered after the founders first and then after the investors. Uh, but first of all, I'm very happy to welcome on stage my, uh, my colleague, uh, Reese Spence, who will share some of the insight from our recent um, European EdTech founder report and also do a bit of a deeper dive into the Spain and Portugal region. So the floor is yours, Reese. Thank you very much, Hege. Um, firstly, it's it's great to be here and, and speaking with you all today. Um, as some of you might know, BrightEye is the most active edtech focused fund in Europe, uh, investing in seven to 10 new companies every year at Seed and Series A. The companies that we work with help people to learn and grow, and our interests span the early years through to lifelong learning and everything in between. Uh, and we do also have interest in, in related sectors as well. Our team really specializes in helping companies uh, to scale and internationalize across countries, cultures, uh, languages, and, and institutional barriers uh, where they present themselves. So today, hopefully you can all see my screen. Uh, I'll be speaking through some of the headlines from our funding report released in late January, uh, pulling some of the key findings and, and, and putting a, a Spain and Portugal lens on them where appropriate. Um, the report, which we put, to, put together each year, looks at the, the trends, progress and prospects of the European EdTech funding landscape. Now, while an extremely difficult year, 2020 was a, a pretty active time uh, for education and learning technology. Um, it was, in effect, the, the biggest trial of EdTech and learning technologies that could possibly happen. And we fully anticipate many of the changes uh, to be continued for the longer term as learners, institutions and, and corporates develop blended approaches for the future. We expect there also to be a, a gradual rebalancing in effect between spending on offline academic resources uh, versus digital learning. 95% uh, of academic resources still go to offline learning at the moment, while 50% while of learning happens digitally. So that, that disparity uh, is worth $2.7 trillion. So uh, a very extremely large <laughs> number. Um, it's not surprising that the EdTech funding in, in Europe reached record levels in 2020, uh, with $711 million raised across a, a record number of transactions. And we're already seeing evidence that the European EdTech market is beginning to mature. $189 million has already been raised in, in 2021, and, and we're only six weeks into the new year. Um, and if we continue at that rate, uh, we'd reach over 1.6 billion for the year, uh, well over double the, the total of 2020. Um, and while that's exciting in itself, the most significant sign of maturity here is that the, the $189 million has been raised in only 21 transactions, um, meaning that the average round size is, is three times the size of the 2020 average. So 9 million uh, so far this year compared to 3 million in, 20, in 2020. Um, and even if you take out the um, $60 million uh, from the Labster deal earlier this month, um, the average deal size is still more than double the 2020 average, which we hope means that this isn't a, a flash in the pan. Um, it isn't a temporary trend uh, that, it's, that it's here to stay. Looking now at the, the, the split of funding by geography, um, the UK maintained its dominant position in, in European EdTech last year, um, comprising 40% of the total deals funded and taking 30% of, of the value of all deals. But arguably the, the big winner of 2020 was what we've categorized over the past five years as, as the rest of Europe, and most notably Central and Eastern Europe. Um, 
which snapped up four times the number of deals done and, and 12 times the value of deals versus 2019. Uh, now, Spain, despite positioning sixth in the ranking, still experienced significant growth um, of, of more than 250% in 2020 compared to 2019 levels. Um, but the bottom line from this slide, I think, is that the breadth of European edtech entrepreneurship is, is really widening. Um, and we, we might need to update how we present this um, next year if this widening continues, which is a, which is a fantastic uh, problem to have. One of the symptoms of, a, of an exciting area of entrepreneurship and, and the tackling of important projects is increasing involvement of, of generalist funds. And as you see here, we were, we were really pleased to see a generalist Spanish fund, JME Ventures, uh, feature amongst the funds involved in the most ed tech deals in 2020. And we really look forward to, to asking them about that soon, uh, later in the session. Um, this, this said, the, the fact that EdTech-focused funds remain prominent within this deal activity does suggest that a, a certain degree of focus on EdTech does still represent an advantage in, in access and, and, and leading deals in this space. And now a bit more of a focus on Spain and Portugal. Um, it's, a, it's a dynamic and an exciting example of the kind of activity we hope to see right across Europe. And of course, there, there's a lot in its favour. There's, there's a strong educational system with, with a, a great deal of technical firepower. There's three truly global cities that are consistently ranked in the, in the top group of European startup hubs. And, and as well, a, a range of other cities that are attractive to uh, entrepreneurs. And one of the most significant things that's evolving in time across Europe, but, but also particularly in Spain and Portugal, are the increasingly favourable policy environment. Um, that, that's being put together by politicians at, at national, regional and, and local levels where they're looking to incentivize entrepreneurship and, and create favorable tax and regulatory conditions. Um, and of course, these, these conditions make the region an attractive destination for investment. And these conditions plus the investment is leading to a really exciting and diverse set of edtech companies uh, spawning in the region, a couple of which we, we at BrightEye are delighted to work with um, and we hope to be working with more soon. Um, we expect this, this trend to continue. Deal count is rising steadily um, as a VC funding is increasing and the amount raised per deal is, is rising too. And you can see that the, the amount raised by Portuguese and, and Spanish at startups in 2021 is already higher than the 2019 levels and, and around 60% of, of the 2020 levels. And, and just to remind everyone that we're still only six weeks into the year, which of course we, we, we love to see trends like this. And another thing that we, we, we obviously love to see is uh, increasingly diversified paths to, to liquidity. And they have uh, conventionally been limited in the edtech space in recent years, um, with, with the only traditional buyers being the large publishing houses. Um, and to be honest, the, the conditions weren't exactly optimal in 2020, given, given revenue volatility as it, as it made companies far harder to, to value than they might normally be in, in what we'd call normal times. That said, however, um, we did see a, a new wave of strategic buyers coming to the fore, such as ADECO acquiring General Assembly. And even just last week, we saw Renaissance Learning acquiring Nearpod. We're also seeing EdTech unicorns becoming uh, acquirers now, which is very exciting, such as Baiju's acquisition of White Hat and Cahoots acquisition of, of Drops. So, so all in all, um, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the space and um, really looking forward to, to hearing more from the entrepreneurs and investors in, in the thick of it in the sessions that follow. Um, but if you'd like to read the full report and other insights, please do go to our website to check them out and watch this space for further insights and reports in the coming weeks. Uh, so, so thanks again for listening and, and back to, to Hege. Thank you so much, Rhys. Uh, and hopefully that was uh, some, some good advice and insight for you all to take away. And as you can see in the chat, you can find out how to download the full report. Uh, I'm now going to welcome um, David on stage. And he's also joined by Cristobal from uh, Lingo Kids. Uh, and we're hoping also to get Gonzalo from Iron Hack very soon, uh, chasing him. But I'll, um, I'll leave the floor to David and Cristobal uh, to start. Welcome. Uh, and then I'll see if I can push uh, Gonzalo onto stage when he gets in. Sure. Take Look, it away. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Riz, for this very, uh, well, with this great overview. Uh, and uh, as we mentioned, you can download the full report on our website. You have the chat in the link. So, um, FYI, I just talked to Gonzalo really briefly, he's, he's, he's coming, he's here. So um, 
First of all, welcome everyone to the Fireside chat session. I'm David from BrightEye and I'm really happy to meet you all. Um, I've been looking forward to this session for a few days now. I'm not gonna lie and I'm very excited to, to have such great panelists with us today. So a massive thank you to Gonzalo who's, who's coming, to uh, Chris, Chefo, Antonio and Juan for taking your time to share your perspectives today. We really, really appreciate it. And obviously thank you um, to everyone for being here. We know you're busy and we're very grateful to be spending uh, some time with you. So, all right, um, let's start with uh, the first fireside chat on how to expand internationally. So we are very, very lucky to have two amazing Spanish tech founders with us today. Two founders who have built truly international companies that are operating in several countries and interestingly with very different products and, and business models. So let's welcome uh, Chris, who's here. Let's welcome Chris, the co-founder of Lingo Kids, uh, an interactive app that encourages learning through play for kids so that they can learn English that raised, uh, what that announced, a Series B round a few months ago. So congrats on that. And Gonzalo, who is on his way, the co-founder of, of Iron Hack, uh, the leading tech school in Europe and LATAM, who, uh, that uh, recently announced a Series B uh, as well. So congrats, guys. Just a quick note uh, for housekeeping before we start. It is an open uh, Q&A. So please, please feel free to share any questions you have in the chat and we'll get to them. So Gonzalo, Chris, I don't know if Gonzalo is here. I hope you're here. Uh, welcome and thank you. Um, I think it would be great if we could start with your respective background. So can you please share a bit more about yourselves and the genesis of, of Lingo Kids and Aaron Hack? So let's start with Cristobal, I guess. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me well. I was having some troubles in the beginning, but I assume like everything goes well? Yes. Awesome. Um, so you were asking me about the background, kind of like the genesis of Lingo Kids, right? Yes. Perfect. Like, I mean, I will try to make a long story short. Uh, I'm a Spanish, born and raised in Madrid, background in computer science. Um, and after here, I moved like for a few years to Stockholm, to Sweden, uh, did my master's there, kind of like I started a company there, running for a couple of years. That was in 2008 because the iPhone was coming out. Um, crash and burn, long story short, that was my MBA. That's where I learned a lot of the things. <laughs> um, after that, I kind of like joined a friend of mine with another company, a video platform uh, based in Singapore. So I moved a few years to Singapore to like run the whole backend technology and make sure that the scales. Um, that went pretty well. Um, we grew to like 50 million users. We sold the company to Rakuten in 2013. And then after that, a few more months in Rakuten. And decided that, I mean, the, the big corp wasn't really like <laughs> my flavor. So I decided to, to come back to Spain after a decade and say hello to my family. Um, Hi, mom. How you doing? How is everything? And in that context, my sister was having a daughter, my little niece, two years old, and she asked me to help her learn English. So I started looking for products, looking for like things like, uh, you know, like the, the Duolingo, Babel, the Busu, like language learning software that could help my niece. But she was two years old, and obviously like, she couldn't use all these products. Um, so I decided to like do a couple of games for her, just for fun. Um, a long story short, that kind of like led to like publishing some apps in the App Store, uh, working with her, getting some traction, looking at the numbers, realizing that below eight years old, there is close to one million kids worldwide. And there is not a lot of like large companies kind of like working on this space and trying to create interactive experiences for kids, mainly because there was a barrier, um, a keyboard and a mouse that two years old that doesn't know, even know how to read or write, kind of use. So decided to start a company around this, and that was 2014, went to the US, raised some money, decided I was going to do the team um, and the company in, in Spain. Uh, main reason, I wanted to do something from Europe, like I, I think we have fantastic talent here and in Spain, especially like great engineers, uh, great designers, and it was just like, and, like something like I wanted to do. Um, so launched the company in 2016, uh, and then since then, kind of like keep growing, like raising a few funds, growing the team, and today we are almost 30 million families using the product, nine people in the company, and a profitable company, by the way. Uh, I know it doesn't matter too much for VCs, but from a founder's perspective, I can tell you it's a, it's a good peace of mind <laughs> when you reach that stage, and keep pushing. That's, that's what we're doing today. <laughs> Wow, what a background. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. I see that Gonzalo is now here with us. So Gonzalo, welcome. Sure, please, please share a bit more about, about yourself. For disclaimer, Iron Hack is, is part of, of the Bright Eye portfolio. We are, we are super happy to, to support them and to, to be accompanying them uh, in their journey. But uh, just disclaimer, that's it. So Gonzalo, please go ahead. Tell us about the genesis of, of Iron Hack and a bit more about yourself. 
Yes, so thanks everyone, uh, and thanks Bright Eye for, for organizing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so a little bit maybe of background about myself, and then I get on to kind of early uh, how we, kind of the idea of the company and how we got here very quickly. So I'm a civil engineer, uh, born and raised in Spain, and started building bridges across Europe. So worked in Ireland, Italy, Germany, and a little bit in Spain, but always wanted to build something uh by myself didn't really have an idea back you know in 2011 2012 when i went to do an mba that there wasn't much of an ecosystem so decided to go kind of expensive way which is you know to to do an mba um went to the states studied at wharton and there um you know is where i met my co-founder ariel and basically what kind of led us to uh, to start iron hack and kind of the aha moment was seeing that there were 700k and field jobs in IT in Europe uh, and, and uh, growing at a rate of 100K a year. At a time in 2013, when we graduated, where you know there, were, uh, uh, there was a youth unemployment in Spain of around 57%, if I'm not mistaken, more or less, which was you know crazy for me. So you have this you know, structural unemployment in Southern Europe, and at the same time, these openings, right? So I just could not reconcile those numbers. So we, we said, you know, uh, I also, as, as Cristobal mentioned, really wanted to come back to Europe and build something uh, possible in Spain. So said, you know, this is a, instead of seeing as a problem, as a huge opportunity, and decided to kind of move back to Spain, uh, partnered up with Ariel, my co-founder, and uh, started building from Madrid a program to try to help anyone independently of the background transition into, into tech as quickly as, as cost efficiently as possible. Kind of fast forward, a few years now. So this was in October 2013. You know, we raised uh, funding from you know Jamie, who's coming later also, and you know investor we, we share with Lingo Kids. Uh, we raised uh, from you guys, and now I just recently raised with Lumos, uh, an, an American edtech kind of growth uh, fund. Um, we are uh, 150 people full time, and uh, we're present in nine cities. Six in in the state, sorry, six in Europe, three in the Americas. We have a few pro, four programs: web development, UX, UI, data analytics, and cyber, and um, and launch. I'm really, really pushing now online education and and B two B and everything. What we're doing is to get help people get jobs. So we audit our placement results uh, and have uh latest we audited in 2019 we had around 90 percent within six months for graduation um and, and we are in the process of doing that for last year it's gonna you know it's taking a bit of a toll for sure the crisis but we're gonna have strong numbers uh, as well cool thank you guys what what, what yeah. intros so uh, internationalization is, is a big topic right for many ed tech startups so if that's all right let's dive in so the, the very first question is about timing um when did you quote unquote feel that what that it was the right time for you to start expanding into new uh, into new inter international markets? Um, I, I would be curious about, about like, hey, what was really the, the, the aha moment that yeah, you know what, we need to 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 go out and and expand into uh, a new market. So yeah, Chris, if you want to go ahead or Gonzalo, it's up to it's up to you. Go ahead. Yeah, I gonna start. I mean, like in our case, I have to say it's a little bit. <laughs> The other way around. Uh, I mean, you, you know a little bit of my history already. So yeah. um, you were pulled. Yeah, I am um, a global. I believe in global citizenship. Like I, I, I've lived like Sweden, Singapore, San Francisco. Like I don't care. And kind of like when I launched the company, like at the same time, I was not thinking like building something just for Spanish uh, families. I was thinking like, okay, this is a problem like all families around the world might have. So we just do it global from the get to go. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a bit unconventional, but. I mean, for us, um, I think it was a good thing because we could validate like this working in uh, all around the world. Um, so what we're doing today is actually coming from the other side. Like, yes, we have like 30 million families all around the world. The biggest market for us is the U.S., follow up by Mexico, Brazil, and China. Um, but as we keep growing and keep, uh, keep investing in marketing and acquisition, in, in, in getting uh, families to know us, uh, we are starting to develop a strategy on a per-country basis. Mm -hmm. So we can create more like a brand awareness. Like... Did you say something, Gonzalo? Sorry. No. Okay. <laughs> there was some noise no, there. No, keep going. Keep going. No, I was just saying like yeah, we're starting to develop that um, go-to market on a per-country basis, so we can start working 
beyond the pure organic growth and the pure kind of like um, a, a pay performance marketing, uh, which we do, um, into like a mass media channels, so working with uh, PR agencies, working with like uh, partnerships. Uh, uh, one of the focus, for example, right now is in the US, and it's a combination of like influencer marketing together with PR, together with partnerships like T Mobile, Safety Children Foundation, or, or UNICEF uh, there. And kind of like trying to develop that playbook that we can potentially replicate in, in other markets um, uh, that, that we see are very good for us. Um, so yeah, I know it's the other way around. Like I, I, I'm not sure. Like I recommend this for everybody, but I mean it's the path, the path we took, and um, so far so so good. Great, Gonzalo. What about you? When did you feel it was the, the right time for you to expand outside Spain? You're on mute, I guess. We can't hear you. Gonzalo, you are on mute. Let's see. Doesn't work. Okay, it's all right. So we'll get back to that question. Don't worry. Um, the next question. So Chris, why do we have you here? So we're gonna drill you. Uh, look, no worries. A question that we get a lot from from uh, founders and ed tech uh, uh, entrepreneurs is really. How do you select new markets? I know that in your case, it's a bit different. It's, it's the other way around. So you got, you got uh, perhaps the approach is, 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 is not uh, so similar to, to Iron Hack. But how do you select new markets? In your case, you mentioned Brazil, uh, China, the US. Um, did you guys have had a framework uh, in mind for assessing new markets and, and, and any specific metrics that you deeply look at when making a decision on, hey, we should double down on, on that market? Yeah, so, um, I mean, as I share, like, from the get-to-go global, right, and it was a lot of organic traffic from all over the world, and we started doing performance marketing and kind of, like, investing in, like, um, well, traditional performance marketing channels like Facebook, YouTube, and so on, uh, all around the world. We don't care where the user comes from, where, they come, where the family comes from, like, uh, all the families are good for us. Um, but as we are developing kind of like this go-to market study in a per country basis, what we're looking at is in a different things. Like to, to start with, like a um, very important aspect for us is, is the demographics, right? Like, I mean, for example, uh, people ask me like, we don't, why do we don't invest more and we don't keep growing in Spain? Um, for us, the reason is like, while Spain is very interesting, obviously, um, the size of the uh, um, population and the overall pyramid population it doesn't look very promising in the sense of like fertility rate, like how many kids we're expecting for the future and so on. Uh, so when we look at those demographics, we see markets like Mexico, Brazil, US, or China again, like very much more interesting for us, much larger population, uh, much younger population, more um, kids expected in the future. That's one aspect of it, the demographics. The second one is in terms of um, how well uh, or how, how how much is the willingness to pay for a product? Uh, and that's something that we measure very well with performance marketing. Basically, um, we see kind of like what's the return of investment when we do like some growth uh, tactics in, in Mexico, Brazil, like what is the return of investment of all the marketing dollars that we put in? And can we like double down in those markets, right? Like can we double down in the US? Can we, if we are investing half a million today, can we invest 5 million like in six months or in 10 months? Um, that's the second piece. And I think the third piece as well, and, and this is, um, um, I mean, more, I would say, strategic for us is looking kind of like in the markets that we will see opportunities for do like strong partnerships in the future and even potentially um, uh, some kind of like liquidation event or exit event. Uh, who can we work with in the future and so on? And kind of like decide, okay, like these markets are interesting for us because potentially there is a, these companies that we could partner, work, merge, mm -hmm. be sold in the future as well. That's cool. Th thank you, Chris. And one very quick question. Is uh, CPI a big factor for you? So the cost, the cost per install. For instance, uh, we know that, that Brazil uh, has, uh, has, is, is usually very low. So it is something that, that you, you look at and, and, and that influences your, your decision as well? No, not at all. Okay. I don't even know what is a CPI. Uh, we look at the return of investment. So, I mean, like the reality is like different markets, they have like different CPIs. They're Right, like I mean, yeah. you might have a very good CPI in uh, some sort of Asian market, uh, but then the conversion rate to like trialing a subscription, like it's not as good. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same, the, the same with like countries, it happens with the platforms, right? Like the CPI on Android is cheaper than the CPI and iOS. Renewal rates in iOS are higher than renewal rates in Android. So we do this, like we work very much with the data. Uh, we, we have a really good uh, engineering and data teams. Uh, basically, yeah. are projecting all these things, projecting renewal curves, like using historical data and segmenting all these based on country, on platform, and on acquisition channel. Uh, and then we look, okay, what is the cost of acquiring a user versus kind of like what's the expected lifetime value? Uh, mm -hmm. Famous LTV over CAC uh, equation. And that's the bigger driver when we're looking into uh, where do we double down in terms of investment. Okay, very clear. Gonzalo, we have you back. Happy yeah. to have you back. Uh, so look, the first question really was like, hey, when did you, did, did you feel that it was the right time for you to start expand, expanding outside Spain? Yeah, so uh, for us, what's important, it's uh, more so maybe than outside of Spain, uh, it's campus by campus or city by city basis. So in our strategy, uh, we, there was always in the roadmap do a kind of a land grab before. So stay very focused in terms of product, go to a bunch of cities with very particular um, dynamics and metrics that we look at. Um, but the actual timing, it was, we actually got pulled a little bit also. So we had uh, someone with collaborating with us. And in the end, when we came down to saying, listen, let, let's, you know, drop a contract, this kind of stuff. He said, no, you know, I'm doing another project and so on. And then this person kind of uh, tried to launch a competitor in Barcelona. Um, and, 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 you know, and, and these things happen, but, you know, it took also the logo, you know, the hexagon. And we said, okay, this is, you know, this is, might be too much. So we launched you know, at the same time on, you know, the same day. Uh, he wasn't able to launch. Um, and, and that kind of got us to Barcelona. Um, and that accelerated, you know, we proved that we were able to do it pretty fast. Uh, kind of started working on the playbook. Then my business partner launched uh, uh, Miami, right, Ariel, and then that that's when we, you know, that those we did ourselves, we developed our playbook, and then we went to, you know, we went on a pretty aggressive uh, timeline to launch uh, Analytics. Got it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't want to re reveal any secrets, uh, secret sauce here, but your playbook is amazing. Your expansion playbook is 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 very impressive. And, 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 and yeah, so it, this leads me to the second question that I asked uh, to Chris is, how do you select new, uh, a new market? In your case, I know it's, it's cities, campus by campus and so on, but it's, it's like, uh, gener generally speaking, um, yeah. How do you, yeah, what metrics do you look at uh, when, so, when, when assessing? Super so, so similar to, to Chris in the sense that we look at, uh, you know, purchasing power population. So we wanna go to big, uh, um, how do you say, uh, metropolitan areas uh we the, and then we triangulate uh we triangulate that there has to be opportunity and bunch of jobs so we look at vacancies in certain uh, in, the, in the tech market and you have some leading indicators to those vacancies such as you know investment in tech and the number of companies beyond a certain size right because we believe that there's going to be a digital transformation and so on uh and then we back that with you know purchasing power um uh, to see if unit economics would fit, and that's kind of the basic equation we we do and how we select. And within, let's say, the American and Europe, we we haven't we for for the sake of focus, if you can call that focus, right? We 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 try to stay uh, into in, in these two kind of continents or three continents. Um, uh, we could go potentially. There's so many more cities that fit, but for for the time being, we have there's so much on our plate. And I would add uh, uh, maybe another factor that now comes into play regarding B two B. So when you know that there's starting to be opportunities where you know we have the CEO of massive company where with whom you know we've done uh, amazing things, right? This person gets hired as an executive of this incredible you know a firm in the Netherlands. Or, uh, sorry, in in, in a particular country where it may be, then we might, you know, go with him or her right to this to this uh, country, pursue a particular program and then use that as kind of a land for expansion. Um, so uh, we as we are, we, we have different business lines and the rate of fit allowed one another. So now we use before we used the B to C our campuses to launch the other ones. And now we, we, we can use different different modalities to go to market. Okay, and can you guys talk a bit more about your team organization? Um, do you have like an internal, di internal 
dedicated team to internationalization and opening new markets or is it yeah how, how, how are you structured because it's obviously like managing the operation uh, uh in 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 so many different countries is, is is a challenge by itself so just curious to, to understand a bit more the structure of your team yeah so i start go yeah. for it yeah okay so i mean i i, I guess you can suspect what my answer is gonna be <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the team is like um, it's all is it one global team like doing everything from all around the world. Um, the way we're structured is basically around missions. Um, so each team has a different mission, and then they're they composed of like different disciplines. Uh, we may have a team dedicated to like these kids discover, uh, discovery, like focusing on like improving the UX the recommendations and like content that we show to kids and improving that piece. Uh, we may have another team focusing on like kids con interactive content like building the games and these type of things um then for example on the live ops team which is in charge of like uh, special events and it's also included there kind of like the customer success piece and community what we do there is like for example having people that works in um uh, they can talk right in like uh, brazilian portuguese and spanish and english but it's embedded within the thing the, the same team and kind of like doing everything on a global basis um, what we're starting to like think right now, and this is again where we're moving like into like this from global and keep the global perspective, but then we start to like to build units on a per country basis. It's like creating these playbooks of like partnerships, PR, and uh, content marketing, and then like a small teams so, of like three to four people interdisciplinary focusing on like one particular region. Um, but that's a direction that we're taking, it's not quite done yet. What about you, Gonzalo? Yeah, so we, we went, we came from the other way, so we started very local, we had a, an expansion team for Europe and, and one for Latin America. Our business is very, very, very local in many aspects. Then with COVID, we centralized everything. Those people kind of came into, uh, and even before, into part of the executive team. And then um, right now we're trying to kind of find in the balance between, you know, a centralized ops uh, kind of vision for many departments and uh, coordination and localization of you know content of uh, acquisition uh, tactics and whatnot right so it's it's a balance we're still uh, trying to figure out but definitely we think uh, localization goes a long way at least in our business and uh, and it's important that we don't don't lose that we went as i said completely the other direction centralized everything also it was easier to go through those tough times uh tough months uh, but now again i, I think uh, we're, we're finding a balance now got it and then one last question because i know we are uh, i'm conscious of time here you know we have and you have questions in in the chat dimitris uh, just ask one um in terms of go-to-market strategy um have you noticed if acquisition channels vary according to countries or region and because obviously one market can be very different uh, from another so so how do you manage all the lead acquisition efforts and and how do you make sure that uh, it's it's um, perhaps you you need to adapt your 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 efforts to the local market perhaps you don't i don't know but i, I would be curious to understand a bit more uh, here the, the the strategy or playbook that you guys uh, have adopted uh, don't tell if you want to keep uh, going so in terms of uh, adapting uh, the customer acquisition, oh, sorry, yeah, that's uh, right, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So we, so again, uh, as I said before, we before, uh, let's say we had eighty percent of the budget uh, led by, uh, by or, or, or to be spent right by, by the general manager, so it was local, and then a few aspects such as you know data and performance marketing mainly uh, handled, which was around twenty percent handled by, by, by HQ. Uh, we put 100%, you know, uh, then in, in kind of centralized. And now we think it's going to go back to maybe 50-50. So for us, it's key to understand, you know, out of the big buckets uh, within the marketing team, what's centralized, what's not, uh, or what is localized, and then what's kind of 50-50. So we're in the kind of process of figuring that out. But from a philosophical standpoint, we want general managers to have to be PL owners. Yes. So they're going to have the the go no go and, and have a very important uh, uh say on the strategy but then it's also important to you know stand on the soldier, sold, soldiers of giants right and learn from what everybody else is doing right as we have so many campuses uh so that it's important the coordination and vision from a central marketing team also is super important so 
anyway, I don't know if, even if that was a, an answer, but but th there's a lot of detail, and I mean, we can be talking, uh, you know, for ages, and uh, but, but but we're finding that that we have to do it team by team, and philosophically that that um, that uh, the the, the PNL has to be uh, the owner has to be the, the general manager, and that's kind of principles we're we're following. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Chris, I would assume that it's quite the opposite for you, but I don't know. Tell us. Yeah, I mean, um, again, everything global uh, from the get to go. I mean, when it comes to like more like focus, um, especially like around localization and things like this, uh, again, we look at where the customers are, how many languages we can support. We have also community patterns, for example, and we know like, okay, like right now it's like the top languages are like English, uh, Spanish, Brazilian, Portuguese, Chinese. So we kind of like localize all the items in that piece. Um, when it comes, for example, to the acquisition, what we do is, uh, we have a very data informed team and basically what we do is like test different variations of different ads, creative messages and so on um, in the local markets uh, and then kind of like see which ones work better and which ones resonate better. Yeah. Um, what we are starting to see though as well, not only on a, uh, something I mentioned earlier was like, okay, like the go to market, like PR partnerships and so on, uh, but something that is very interesting as well is that um, kind of like, because we build everything on a global basis, we're missing like, mm, mm, sometimes much of the nuance like some particular countries have. Uh, we started, for example, like uh, last year in the US, like suddenly like we have to communicate parents and some parents were asking things like, you know, how do I talk to my children about the Black Lives Matter movement? And then of course that was very local to the US, like outside of the US, maybe people was not interested in that topic. And then we have families, for example, in Singapore asking us like, oh, you have all these games and activities teaching my children about fru uh, fruits and vegetables and things like this. Um, but where is the dragon fruit? Or where is the durian? And then it's like, okay, like, <laughs> I, I don't think even people in Spain know what, is the, what, what those fruits are. <laughs> so um, we started like roll out this like per country basis. So we started to look at the nuance of the local culture as well. And when it comes to like talking to parents and when it comes to popular culture, like Thanksgiving as well in the US, very big. In Spain, nobody knows when it's Thanksgiving. Like the Three Kings in Spain, very famous. In the US, I don't think it's that famous. Um, so start looking at those uh, particular pieces and kind of like rolling out in the content strategy and kind of uh, on the community strategy. Wow, super insightful. Thank you, guys. And I'm going to cheat here. Uh, I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, pick one question uh, that Ben, one of the Bright Egg partners, uh, asked a very interesting question in the chat so I can link it to the next panel, which is, in, uh, which is uh, more about fundraising. So. I'm gonna read his, his 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 question here. So, uh, so you guys raised the Series B recently. So, can you please comment on the fundraising environment for tech companies at the moment, and was there a particular revenue threshold or benchmark that catalyzed investor interest? So, yeah, maybe I can go. So, for us, I mean, historically, it's been tough to raise capital. I think for, you know, at least more m m most Sp Spanish companies that I talk to, I think it's been. Historically, a bit tough, especially when you get to larger rounds. Um, in our case, this has been surprisingly easy. Um, um, we weren't looking for to, to fundraise. Uh, we didn't have any conversations uh, other than with Lumos, and we need them for a while. So all that you know, I've always read about you know building relationships pay off. I always thought it, it well, I never thought it would it would it was this real, and it, and it actually has worked tremendously well. Two, two milestones that kind of for us were really, uh, were crucial were for growth equity, you know, be close to break even or break even uh, with, you know, strong unit economics. Second, uh, second, we, we, we had to kind of uh, launch to, or we launched a business line that is a lot more scalable and having traction there. And I mean, scalability is, 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 is key. Uh, and those two things uh, really uh, were really, really helpful for us. Got it. Thank you. What about you, Chris? Any insights here? Yeah, so on my end, I mean, a couple of disclaimers, I think. is like the first one is education technology per se, I, I think my experience, and at least from people I know from Spain outside, it's been always <laughs> kind of like a tough environment. Uh, like, there was not so much interest. I think ha things have changed uh, now. Um, bittersweet, but thanks to like yeah. the global situation, um, the second piece I want to say is like, uh, I mean, in terms of like the naming, whether it's CSA, CSB, or CSC, yeah. I, I don't think it's that important because, you know, like you have all these kind of crazy things right now, like people raising like a pre-seed round of like $50 million. <laughs> <laughs> so in my experience, at least it's more about kind of like, first, what have you done with previous money? Um, whether, I mean, 
you can explain, okay, I've used this money to do these things and I achieved these goals that you got, like you, you were projecting and doing and so on. And the second piece in terms of like how much you raise is like, can you actually deploy that money efficiently? Right? Like maybe I could go right now and talk to like some like crazy fund and get like a hundred million or $200 million, but can I know, do I know how to deploy that kind of money? Uh, I, I don't think so, honestly. Like, I mean, if you give me a hundred million dollars right now, I go, we work. Like that's, <laughs> that's what is gonna happen. So can you prove that you know how to manage that money and like do it? Um, beyond those two things, um, I mean, our particular situation, we were growing very nicely, like um, first year 4X, 3X second year, uh, 2X on the following year. Uh, very close to break even as well. Uh, we already passed break even uh, last year. Um, and uh, good unit economics, uh, as, as uh, Gonzalo said. Uh, in our case, it's a consumer subscription business. Yeah. So anything like, uh, at least in this space, two to three X is a good range to be. I know in like B2B SaaS, normally they talk about higher, like above three X, like four or five X, but I don't think anything in consumer subscription goes like four or five X realistically, but maybe they do. Got it. Thank you. Super insightful again. Thank, thanks, guys. Um, Gonzalo, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cheat one more time. So sorry. I'm going to cheat, guys. Just <laughs> one more question. One great question was asked in, in, in the chat by Dimitris for Gonzalo. Uh, so Dimitris is an, is an ed tech uh, consultant and is asking, so what proportion of your students are using uh, income share agreements and how has that financing instrument performed? And, and, and the second question really is, uh, would you consider uh, JVs for expansion or joint ventures for expansion into other cities that would uh, internally classify as tier two, tier three opportunities? So the first question is really uh, on, on encouraging share agreements and the second one is about the expansion. And, and then I promise we're gonna move to the next, to the next uh, uh, panel. But, yeah, I'll, I'll be quick, super quick. So ISAs for now uh, it has been nominal. Uh, we maybe we haven't been able to explain them well, but you know in Europe they we just haven't seen traction whatsoever with this this uh, option. The kind of markup uh, is significant for this to make sense to the providers, and and uh, it's been it's been it it just with with the with the uh, bunch with the amount of credit available to to anyone right consumer credit it's just that hasn't you know I, I don't think it makes that much sense um could be interesting for latin america and the states but sure. there we have some done some trials but haven't pushed it but there it, it's within our plans to give it more push what has worked tremendously well is uh unemployment help in in countries like germany uh france a little bit in the netherlands uh, we have significant uh, percentage of our students and i'm going to say what percentage but um come from you know that, that type of help which is you know i think a, tr a tremendous job by the government uh in terms of jvs we are open um yeah. for different deals with uh and right now in conversations with uh, a couple of people so uh any if, if anyone has any any uh you know offers or whatever just uh let me know Got it. Thank you, guys. Thanks again for for taking your time. Super uh, interesting uh, insights, and 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 yeah, we really really appreciate your time and all the ins the, the the advice and tips that you shared. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Take care. What a pleasure. So now we can move on to the investor panel with our friends from GME, Kibo, and Mustard Seed Maze. Welcome, guys. Welcome on board. I can't see Juan now, but hopefully uh, he's not too far. Chris, you're still here. I mean, if you just want to hang, yeah. uh, hang out, it's fine. Uh, uh, so, uh, guys, Jose, Antonio, why don't you start by introducing yourselves and, and, and your fund? We can, we can start with you, Antonio, if you, uh, if you like. Sure. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, we at the MSM Fund, we're a, a VC fund with an impact strategy. And when I talk about impact, I talk about social and environmental impact. So we invest in early stage tech enabled ventures that are using their solutions to address topics such as inequality of access to education, which is relevant to what we're going to discuss today but really any kind of sizable global social or, or environmental um, problem that we're facing. And we do it because we believe that impact is in fact one of the biggest economic opportunities of our times. It's a great lever to have 
consumers more engaged is what talent wants. You've got sizable problems that hide bigger opportunities and the cost of capital for companies that embed environmental and social considerations is also going to lower as more and more capital is allocated into sustainable assets. Um, we've launched the fund, it's a 40 million fund. We've launched the fund in October 19 and we've made 16, I have one, 16 investments. We love working with, with you at Bright Eye um, and we're very interested in all the new wave of bad tech ventures that we're seeing across Europe. Cool, thank you, Antonio. I, I can see that Juan is now here. Good to see you, Juan. Uh, Chefo, do you want to do you want to go and introduce yourself and your fund really briefly? Sure. Uh, hi all. Uh, my name is Jose. Uh, I'm principal at JME. Uh, we're a BC, a Spanish BC fund uh, with 120 million under management. We're very agnostic, but it happened that uh, for our second fund, we've been pretty active on the edtech space. Uh, luckily, because it has been pretty pretty exciting uh, environment and, and companies. So um, yeah, that uh, uh, agnostic uh, VC and uh, you know, investing between 200k and 3 million the first ticket, yeah. more or less. Got it. If I may add, so agnostic but very active in edtech. I mean, you guys saw in the in the, in the slide that Riz shared at the beginning. GME is is the second most active investor edtech investor in 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 Europe. So that's uh, that's brilliant. And Juan, what about you? Please uh, tell us more about about uh, Kibo and your background. Sure. Uh, can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so well, thank you. Thank you for you know for having me. Um, Kivo Ventures is a fund that is based in Madrid, has offices in Barcelona and Lisbon. So uh, you know, pretty much focused on Europe, but uh, with a weekly week week uh, spot for you know Portugal and Spain. We've also been very active in edtech. We have, uh, I think, from the second fund, uh, we've already had like four investments in in edtech. So it's a it's a sector in which we believe um, um, a lot. Um, having said that, we are also agnostic. We have we are now in we just launched our third fund. So among the whole asset seller management is, is almost around uh, two fifty million, something like that. So um, again, tickets is between one and three million. So we get we come in in um, what we call in you know South Europe Series A. Yeah. I think for you know uh, European standards that would be called see the stage anyways so um, um yeah looking forward to you know for for this conversation i can clarify anything thank you guys thank you thank you um so look the, the region uh, especially spain the region is becoming a hot market for ed tech companies at the moment and we know for a fact that there are a few great series a's that are likely to be raised this year so the burning question here is like what's happening in your region what's happening in portugal antonio what's happening in spain jose and juan uh, how have you seen evolve the ed tech scene in, in 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 your region over the past three to five years who wants to go first I can go with you on. So for me, what was shocking was the, the difference between pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? Mm. Because uh, pre-COVID, we were uh, internally in JME, we were pretty excited about the space, but not all the investors in, in Europe in general were that excited. And post-COVID, I don't know, uh, well, it's, it's clear why, but uh, that value, that hidden value, let's say, of the EdTech companies have arise all, all of a sudden. Uh, uh, obviously, due to to people at home, different kinds of, of communication, or all, all of that, right? But uh, that that has been pretty shock uh, for me. Got it. What about you, Antonio or Juan? Yeah, from from our side, I mean, surely, like COVID has accelerated suddenly a lot of gradual trends that that we were, of course, seeing. I think if if anything for for the ad tech space it has helped educate uh parents and to increase their willingness to pay because now suddenly they're more concerned about and i'm focusing here on ad tech for like schools or or, or kids k-12 related stuff so you see some changes um that have been um accelerated by by COVID. what we've also seen and you cannot really say that there is a kind of Portuguese ad tech scene, right? The market is small. And so companies that, that are born here in the space think European and global from the get-go. But you, you do see 
less of a content-based, heavy content-based approach and more like picks and shovels into what kind of plugins and adjacent enablers you have in, in the ad tech space. I mean, you were talking about ISIS before. We've made an investment in that space because we're actually quite bullish on, on the opportunity there, not necessarily on the funding part, but on the data play that, that you have around it. And as an impact fund, I also have to say that we see a huge opportunity in how every all the digital transition that we're seeing has created a lot of opportunities, mm-hmm. but it's also leaving big gaps. And whoever is filling in those gaps in terms of access and affordability to online learning, whether it is the you know schools or any kind of other industry, we're also likely to see winners in that space. We are inherently early stage investors, so that's at the stage we're looking at, and we're seeing some interesting solutions in that space, trying to pick up the cracks of what COVID has created. Got it. Thank you. Juan, do you want to go? Well, I, 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 I tend to agree to what, uh, you know, uh, Jose and Antonio have, have said. I would add that um, even before COVID, I think there were there were some wins um, around EdTech that were really interesting. Mm-hmm. Some of them, and I agree, uh, would come from, from the U.S., so there were trends there that you could imagine, you know, uh, uh, some nuances changing uh, that could hit in uh, Europe. Um, you know, um, I think in the first panel, um, you, you guys have talked about ink and share agreement. Uh, we we didn't buy that, and I kind of agree with what uh, had been said. But uh, for example, in training for corporates, mm-hmm. there were a lot, uh, a lot, a lot being done in the in the U.S. that could. Um, um, transition to Europe and I've seen uh, so many companies we invest in some of them um, some of others are not applicable like you know the tu- tuitions in the states are high uh, you sure. know people are in debt I don't think Europe is you know a complete translation of that so that that has some nuances but I think there were there were really good interesting trends around that that we can talk about but um, uh, even before COVID I think it was a strong strong thing to uh, to follow. Yeah, got it. And and you touch a very important point, uh, Juan, about valuation at the beginning. Is uh, have you guys seen the valuation uh, valuations uh, sorry change over time uh, in in the ed tech with with ed tech uh, local ed tech companies in Spain or, or Portugal? Antonio, I know that the the ed tech scene in 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 Portugal is is still nascent, but uh, I would be curious just to see if yeah you to to get your thought about the valuations, the ed tech valuations in Spain and Portugal, and the evolution of it. I mean, the yeah. two cents on it is that valuations have been increasing in general. Like, can you actually isolate ed tech as a sector on it? I mean, Europe as a whole, you have a bunch of second and third time founders and valuations, you, you pay a little bit more on that because of more experienced teams yeah. as well. There's more capital flocking. The European Union is investing directly in companies. I mean, all of that plays, plays, plays a role. Uh, so we've certainly seen it in general, um, but I generally don't know if you can just attribute it to ad tech because of the COVID acceleration that we've seen. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. A- any other thoughts, guys? Uh, Juan, Tefo? Yeah. So from, from my point of view, also, it has happened that first, there is no competition on local business, talking about Spain, yeah. uh, plus again, international business also coming to Spain. So that's pushing a bit up the valuations. Plus also on the positive side is the side is the, the, the better quality of the companies. So in, in terms of numbers, I think we have not seen an increasing number, like, but in terms of quality, we've seen it. So I think both of them makes valuation go, go higher. Got it. And, 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 yeah. It's, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, sorry, I, I was going to say that I'd say that EdTech has gotten um, uh, uh, lately um, more recognition and that drives the uh, multiple side for sure. So I'd say I, I agree 100%, like valuations have gotten a high in general, but yeah. I think EdTech as a trend is has been more identified. It went through a, you know, a lot of um, a small des- desert, um, you know, uh, a while ago with the MOOCs not, you know, kind of monetizing and everything. And, uh, and I think now it has gotten some traction and that drives up the multiples. 
No, yeah, no, and guys, you're completely right. I mean, what I've seen, I mean, when I joined Bright Eye three years ago, is that there there is a big difference today in in the, in terms of uh, the round, uh, the size rounds, and 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 valuations. Uh, in in only three years across Europe, not only in Spain or Portugal, we, we can see a, a big difference. Uh, uh, and, and yeah, so it's, it's marketing is is becoming a bit more competitive. Uh, the market is beco- is is uh, becoming about nature. So so that's uh, that's what's happening here. But um, and in terms of local trends, what, what are the local ed tech trends that you are currently excited about? And and yeah, Juan, if you want to go for, go go first, um, yeah, would love to 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 know more about that because yeah. you guys know the ed tech space really well. As you said, you have four investments in your second fund, so would really pick your brain. Would love to pick your brain. So so I, I get very excited about many things. So um, um, I, let me let me just try to pick some that I don't think are as um, at least as um, I'd say identified as some others, right? So yeah. one is uh, audio learning. Audio learning is something that um, um, I've been following for a while. Audio is is getting trendy a- everywhere. But I think in Spain, there are a couple of companies that are doing um, uh, some things. They're really early uh, as of today. And yeah. I want to keep it for myself, but I, I think they're going to do well. Uh, are you uh, sure? Don't then, you want to share them with us? Oh, no, no, no. I, I just... Uh, <laughs> We're we're working we're, it's uh we're working with them right now but I wanted to share just because you know for for the sake of of the yeah of the conversation there are other things that uh you know productivity tools have I think gotten into the student tool set and mm-hmm. I think it's another thing that I, I I'm seeing as something that I'm getting excited about um so those those are the two that I'd say are not common knowledge mm-hmm. uh, we could talk about other things that I think are more common knowledge for example you know um schools uh getting some sort of uh software just because they realize that during COVID, you know they are kind of lacking some, some sort of knowledge in digitation uh but those are the two that i'm more excited about and less less probably less common cool so audio learning and productivity tools for 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 students essentially what about you antonio yeah, I mean, from conversations with with founders here on the on the ground, I mean, there's there's two things that we find interesting. One is how some of the founders in this space are actually anticipating a post pandemic, where we've been from you know almost fully offline to fully online, and they're catering to have solutions that have modular online to offline, and basically it's a tiered platform approach rather than. A mutual exclusive approach and I, I find that quite interesting because I, I think people are craving for offline and meaningful connections and it's just a great way of learning with situational live examples and the second one is is the unbundling of of skill sets uh, training um, and you know we've started seeing Aaron hackers was talking before you're starting to see in other verticals of skills um, I mean there's big opportunities to be grabbed uh, we need a lot of nurses and elderly care support is a space that is still up for disruption because it's quite offline and antiquated and, you know, we'll all need it in the near future. Um, so that unbundling is also quite interesting. Yeah. And and, and really briefly, Chefo, what about you? I know Hege is here to keep us on on, on time. We could go on and on, but uh, Chefo, exactly. please. Yeah. For me, really quickly, uh, first is what is what what is going to happen to curricular companies, so traditional publishers that sell te- textbooks for schools. Okay, I think that there's a massive opportunity for newcomers and challengers there, uh, like not selling the proper textbook, but other ways of teaching that uh, science, uh, science, maths, or whatever. So I think there's a big space there. And also something that is not very popular in Spain, but I'm, I'm, I'm lately reading a lot about it, is uh, homeschooling. Okay. Um, that's interesting me a lot. There's no many companies in, 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 in Spain, especially doing this, but I think there's something there. Got it. Thank you. Hey, Gate, do we have time for one extra cre- que- uh, question on, on predictions or it's or I, I, I really hate to interrupt them being the one with the time, but I think also some of the panelists have to run, even okay. though it's probably not running physically. I, so I, I, I hate to interrupt. I hate to break you off. It's super interesting to listen to. Uh, but hopefully we can take the conversation further offline maybe we'll meet on clubhouse or something <laughs> but yeah. i just want to thank thank the panel thank 
thank thank you david thank the previous panel everyone it's been super super interesting and we're again very excited to host these events and looking forward to doing them again so we have another monthly event coming up uh, in exactly a month uh, on the 24th of march where we'll be we'll we be stopping in germany uh, and we'll be talking to Tandem, the language learning app with the CEO Arndt Schentrup. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you all uh, in Germany. <laughs> and please um, follow us on, on LinkedIn, Twitter to make sure you don't miss out on anything. And we'll, we'll, be, we'll be there with uh, more details for the next event very soon. But for now, thanks so much to all the panelists. It's been, it's been great to listen to you all. Thank and you thanks to everyone much. listening in, of course. <laughs> sure. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks. Thank you to the panelists. And, and, and yeah, thank, thanks for joining us and see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank bye -bye. you.